The current day Garden of Gethsemane sweeps across a desert plain with groves of olive trees. It is by Middle Eastern standards a mountain, hence the Mount of Olives. Now, those of us here would probably call it a hill. But it's beautiful in a very simplistic way, and I can see why Jesus went there to pray. It's a palpable feeling if you ever have a chance to stand there. And maybe it's because Jesus prayed there and we're told sweated drops of blood into the ground there. Maybe that's what makes it holy. Maybe it's the meaning instead of collective generations, the meaning that they have given it that makes it holy. Maybe it's simply the fact of its natural world beauty, like other mountain tops that remind us of the transcendence of any moment if we have but the eyes to see it, and maybe it's all of the above. I don't know exactly, but when I was there five years ago on a clergy study tour, I didn't analyze it. I just gave in to the experience of it. And if I hadn't been on a tourist schedule, I might have lingered there until nightfall. But what drew me away from the natural world of the Garden of Gethsemane wasn't that the tour guide was looking for me, which he was. It was instead the sound of music that was coming from the church near the olive groves. I wandered there, and I, I found myself stumbling towards the church, kind of thinking that it might just be another church that felt more like a museum than a living place of worship. We had experienced that some. Not that there's anything wrong with churches that are also museums, but during this trip, I found myself missing an experience of worship in a community, the kind that you can feel as you walk in. So I walked into the church not knowing what to expect, and I found that I was walking right into the middle of a worship service. I tried to stay unobtrusive in the back, but I couldn't help but inching closer. The light was coming in through the windows. The communion table was down on the floor. The priest was breaking the bread and pouring the cup. The music leader was inviting folks to stand and sing and process around the table. And as they were walking around and around the table, they started to sing in rounds. Now, I have no idea what language it was, but it didn't matter. The meaning of the moment was clear, and it was framed by each note and each voice that walked around and around the table. I couldn't understand a word, yet I understood everything. Then I found myself walking around and around the table until others started to come forward for the bread and the cup, and I just kind of followed them, swept up in the moment, feeling at one with total strangers, not speaking the language, but being part of the bigger flow around me as we gathered at the table. The early church was founded around a table, an everyday table. And now we have these kind of ornate churches on the places where we think the first churches were or where we think the big stories happened in our Bibles. But at its inception, it was around a table, either in someone's home or in a rented room, and they would eat and drink and in many ways, they would be merry as they read letters that came in from various missionaries and as they shared their own stories and sang songs and prayed. They fed themselves and one another with bread and olives and grapes and wine. It was known as the agape meal, the meal of love. And it was done, as Jesus said, to remember him when he gave the mandate that they love one another. Obviously, we symbolize this agape meal with our bread and our juice, hearkening the spirit of oneness, linking us to each other and to all the saints through time and space. But what made the early church such a threat to the empire of Rome was just this, a simple little table where all were one. Because around this table, whether someone was a slave or an indentured servant, a free person, a wealthy person, a poor person, a woman or a man, a Jew or a Greek, it was all welcome there. That was not so in society, but around the table, all differences were dissolved for this window of fellowship time as they melded into one in the way of Jesus who they sought to follow. 
but this simplicity became complicated as the early church drew more and more people, especially Gentiles, non-Jews. So what were observant Jews to do? For, for the most part, observant Jews, um, their purity codes did not really allow them to eat with the Gentiles. But now that they were all part of this one Jesus movement, they were struggling with how to make it work. The big burning question was, should the Gentiles be circumcised and then all would be well? Now this was a really, yeah, we can laugh about that. <laughs> it, it's, it's hard for us to understand how big this question was for the early church. What were they to do with this? It was a huge question in the first century. So for some time, observant Jews separated themselves from the Gentiles, keeping them at a physical distance, needing space between the groups approaching the table, yet trying to be this one common spiritual family. It was quite complicated, and it was no simple matter. And we see this throughout our scriptures in the New Testament, that they're wrestling with these very questions. We have in Acts the visions of Peter in Cornelius' house, having his ideas of clean and unclean food challenged, and changed by God. We hear it in the Apostle Paul's strong words throughout his letters where he says the Gentiles do not need to be circumcised to be part of the fellowship. And now here in Ephesians where we are today, we have the same question. It is precisely this question of who can be close and who is kept at a distance that is up for debate. So just before our passage today, the author of this letter says, because of Christ, the dividing wall has been broken down, and with it, any remaining hostility. He goes on to say, that is precisely because of the cross. The Spirit of Christ has come to proclaim peace to those who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him, both groups have access in one spirit to God. And he goes on to say, so then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God. It's hard for us to take in the power of this statement and what it meant at that time. But the power of this statement, it spread and it grew and it became what we now know as Christianity and it transformed the world. And the truth is that over time we have struggled to maintain these ideals this ideal of the open table, and perhaps, if anything, we have at times, more and more, put up dividing walls among us. Now, the Reformation challenged that and eventually began to forge a path back to the table for a broader group of people. And in many ways, we have been making our way back to our roots of inclusivity ever since. Now, the Congregationalist, of which we have our roots here in this church, we have typically been some of the least high church folks where we've tried to be accessible and approachable literally and theologically. And since we became part of the United Church of Christ in the 1950s, we have not perfectly, but sincerely tried to dismantle more and more walls. And right about this time, shortly after the 50s, there there was a big shift in sort of the purpose of the church, the why of the whole church it began to shift. Because for much of its existence, the church had focused on the problem of the non-believer. The purpose of the church was to save souls, to add to its numbers, to bring people into the fold, with really kind of a larger degree on the kingdom of God one day in another world and another realm than right here. Conversions had been the focus. But for portions of the church, of which the United Church of Christ was one, a shift began in earnest in the 70s, away from the problem of the non-believer to the problem of the non-person. What I mean by that is those in society deemed as non-people, the ones who were either ignored or marginalized by the church. So it began to shift with the goal of becoming more relational and inclusive, and less transactional, believing that this is now what discipleship meant. So bear with me here as I get a little academic. What began to happen at this time around the 60s is that into the theological debates entered new theologies 
that challenged and expanded the, classimal, the, class, the classical systematics. So into the fold, we suddenly have liberation and black liberation theology. We have feminist theology. We have queer theology. And I could go on and on and on. So the church began to shift its focus away from exclusively the kingdom of God beyond this life, instead to helping to birth the kingdom of God on earth now, through upholding the personhood of all people. Now, friends, we have continued to try to do this work in our own era. And here in this church, the dividing walls that we have been working to bring down are those of racism, much of what Scott read there as an introdu introduction to the offering. We work to bring down the walls of racism, of homophobia, of sexism, of anti-Semitism. We work to bring down the walls between the poor and the wealthy, really walls between any marginalized group and those in power. And for us, it's part of our worship because it is at the heart of our service to the world. And so spurred on by a number of practical needs, it's time to literally and metaphorically take down more walls in our worship life together now, in our era. I invite you, if you would, to take out your bulletin and just look at the cover. This is odd, grainy, kind of black and white picture. So this is a picture, this is the oldest picture that we have of our sanctuary. It was taken in 1895. And you can see as you look at it that it, it in some ways mirrored the values of its time. It was beautiful in its simplicity and in its spirit. And I have to laugh as I look at it and see all these banners and streamers up top and try to imagine who was the lucky person that got to hang those. <laughs> when the sanctuary was renovated in 1940, it was renovated into what it is now, what you see up here on the chancel. And at that time, they went for a little bit more of a high church f feel. They put in um, a few more things here that sort of create a little bit more separation between the pews and the chancel. The choir, as you see in this picture, you may not know, but where there are these sort of buntings here, you can see organ pipes behind it, that's where the original choir sang from. And then with the renovations, they moved up here as they are right now today in our choir stalls, mostly facing each other. I don't have to tell you if you've been with us for a while that sometimes it's hard to get the sound from here to there. I'm not going to turn the sermon into a list of the renovations that we're proposing. I simply invite you to come to the tour and read all of our information. I will simply say this, that now it's time to move even further back to our roots in a way that we can make everything that happens up here available to every person and to even more lower the distance between clergy and worship leaders and you all. The time has come to have our worship space reflect our theology now, just as it did in this church in 1895 and in 1940. And this is especially needed right now in 2023 as we are continuing to come out of COVID, this time of deep isolation and disconnection. It's time to let this hallowed space live into its next iteration that in increases connection that keeps moving us away from faith as transactional and towards faith as relational. For this space to uphold our value of increasing access for everyone on every level and dismantling all dividing walls. Standing on the Mount of Olives that day, taking in the view, the earth and the sky, I was aware of the holiness of its simplicity and beauty but being swept into the worship of the congregation and the church reminded me of what can only be experienced in community, in the connection between worshipers, even if we don't speak the same language. It is the palpable presence of God that is made real in the space between one another as we are together, and it is different. And the space that that, happen in, that, that happens in matters. 
We can go anywhere as a body of Christ together, and anywhere we go, we are a Hancock church because always the church is a community. It is not a building. But having a building, having a space that is conducive to how we worship now directly impacts how we live into the call that God has given us in this era, which is that inspired by the life and teachings of Jesus, we are changing the world through love, compassion, and courage so that in our own day, we too are breaking down dividing walls and building indeed even a longer table. May it be so. Amen.